This is All Country Music Radio, the 24-hour country music station. Welcome to the Roundtable Podcast from the Centre of Contemporary Art, Derry, London, Derry. Um, my name is Frank Sweeney and I'm an artist and my practice um, looks at the history of media and forms of uh, communications and the relationship between these and collective imaginaries. This conversation was recorded during the exhibition Ballads of Rhinestones and Newcomers at CCA in 2022. For this, myself and Tom O'D created an installation which looked at the history of analog radio and television signals spilling across the borders of these islands. You can see the documentation of this exhibition at ccadld.org forward slash exhibitions. Um, this round table is made possible thanks to the support of the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, Derry City and Straban C- District Council and the Art Fund. Hi, my name is Tom O'Dee. Um, I'm an artist uh, based in Dublin. Uh, I work across sculpture and media and my work is mostly interested in hi- histories and practices of knowledge and technology. So how they're produced, how they're shared and by whom. This collaboration between Frank and I grew out of a combined interest in analog television and radio signals and community media practices. For this discussion, we were delighted to be joined by John Walsh from Pirate.e. So we'll start with John introducing himself. Hi, this is uh, John Walsh here from Pirate.ie, the online and free Irish pirate radio audio archive. Delighted to be with you today. Looking forward to telling you about the work that we do. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks a million for joining us, uh, John. Uh, we were wondering maybe just to start out, uh, I suppose yeah, the background or why we um, why we wanted to get you on, John, was because the, the website and the Pirate uh, Radio Archive was a really big part of both the kind of early thinking about this project and also some of the, the material is being broadcast in the gallery. So all along the way, I think the archive was just a really kind of vital resource. And I, I actually, I personally can't imagine the project kind of coming to fruition without its existence. Um, so yeah, maybe first of all, you could just, if you could just um, give us, a, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in radio. Sure, Frank. Well, uh, first of all, just to say that I'm delighted that uh, the fruits of our labour is is being picked up and being put to good use um, outside of the our small but dedicated list of followers who are really into this stuff. It's great that um, we have inspired uh, other uh, cultural products, I suppose, for want of a better word. Um, so to give a little bit of background about myself, well, um, I'm from Dublin originally. And um, in my youth, in the 1980s, when I was a teenager, the city was full of pirate radio, ranging from the very large and successful commercial operations like Radio Nova and Sunshine Radio that were as good, if not better, than most of the licensed radio we have today, to small garage hobby style operations run by kids. And I was very much firmly in the latter category. Um, because uh, friends of mine from school um, in the summer of 1986 um, put uh, a pirate radio station on the air. And in the great uh, tradition of pirate radio trying to be respectable, I came on board as the newsreader. (laughs) And the newsreader, of course, doing news on a pirate radio station, for the vast majority of pirate radio stations, doing news meant plagiarism. Uh, It meant simply ripping the news off other formats. If you were very... Uh, adventurous, you might be. You might go out and buy the Evening Press or the Evening Herald and regurgitate some of the stories from their front page. But for the most part, it consisted of recording RTE bulletins and uh, essentially reusing them um, without any credit, of course, or uh, or acknowledgement. Exactly the kind of thing that uh, I would um, 
uh, heavily penalise my students. For now, I work in the University of Galway as a lecturer, but uh, back then I probably wouldn't have known what the word plagiarism meant. But anyway, this small little radio station was called Big Beat Radio. It's not particularly important in the history of uh, of Irish pirate radio at all, um, but it was important for us and for my co-founder of Pirate.ie, Brian Green, who was one of the founders of Big Beat Radio, and it launched us into the into the exciting world of unlicensed radio. And I mean, the, the, the whole thing really, Frank, was about a bit of fun for, for kids during the school holidays. But it also kept us off the streets to a certain extent, gave us access to a, a new and exciting medium, totally unfettered access. We could quite literally do what we want. Um, but we did run into some difficulties because being a poorly built homemade transmitter, we caused uh, some interference to Sunshine Radio up the road in Port Marnock, which wasn't far from where we were based in Baldoyle. And we had a, a, um, a visit one night by the late Peter Gibney, who was the engineer in Sunshine Radio. And uh, we were, I think, more in awe of the fact that the great Peter Gibney had come to visit us than particularly concerned about the interference. But he was actually very nice to us. And um, he uh, he was a bit taken aback when he saw how actually young we were. We were 15 and 16 at the time. But that was Big Beat Radio, which was a happy uh, experience in the summer of 86. And that we carried on then um, with local uh, community style radio stations um, in Dublin 13, in Dublin, um, northeast Dublin, Bayside and Baldoyle, up to the end of 1988, another station called Centre Radio, which was more professional and was really like a community youth project on air. And we see this through the archive that there were some stations that were essentially community youth projects that were broadcasting um, a bunch of kids that that were involved. But it was a more serious attempt and um, technically a bit better and covered a slightly larger area and so on. So um, I was also lucky because in the estate where I grew up in Sutton in Dublin 13, um, there were actually three pirate radio stations at one stage uh, in the mid 1980s. One was a shortwave station called Radio Valerie. Brian Green, my co-founder, was involved in that as well. Then we had our own little stations, Big Beat and Centre Radio. But there was a third station which was called Class, or KLAS, which was an easy listening station. And somehow I managed to blag my way into that station. Um, it was in the same housing estate as where I lived. And that was a bit of a break because it was a more professionally run radio station which was operated by Hugh Hardy, uh, the late Hugh Hardy. And he's very important, as you know, no doubt, Frank, the, uh, the name Hugh Hardy is an important person in Border radio because he was the founder of the Radio Carousel network in Dundalk and in surrounding towns. So Hugh set up a easy listening radio station class KLAS in Dublin in 1986. Not exactly the type of music that I was interested in as a teenager, but it gave me a more credible break into radio perhaps than some of our local uh, operations, which were much more hobby-like and uh, gave me very valuable experience. And I suppose the thing to say really about getting into pirate radio as a kid is that there weren't uh, any divisions between the tasks. You would quite literally end up doing everything. You could be making commercials and uh, compiling news or simply ripping off news or you could be DJing or you could be answering the phone or you could in fact be doing all of those things at once. So this kind of multi-skilling meant that there were an awful lot of people by the time the pirates were shut down at the end of 1988. There were actually a lot of people in Dublin who had a lot of broadcasting skills and uh, the whole pirate radio era probably saved RTE a fortune in uh, training courses because the majority of people who were coming into RTE from the pirates already knew how how to do the job. So the very exciting era, um, Frank, one that I look back with a great uh, fondness at and um, gave me a fantastic uh, break. And I went on to become a professional journalist in local radio and eventually in RTE after that. So it certainly started me off on, on a track that became a career for me eventually. Yeah, that's um, that's great, John. I think there's so many things there that we might come back and uh, touch on again, not least uh, H H H Hugh Hardy, um, who we have a picture of on the wall beside us here. So we might come back to some of that. But one thing um, that might be good also at the start is just to talk a little bit also about Pirate.ie and how how that project's come about um, more recently. Sure, absolutely. Well, in the summer of 2018, um, myself and Brian Green, who I'm in touch with, 
after all of these years still. Um, we attended a fascinating event in Luxembourg, in the University of Luxembourg, which was a summer school in trans-border radio. So essentially it was looking at radio signals that spilled across borders, very similar to what you're doing with the exhibition in Derry, uh, Tom. Um, but um, the the event, um, we were sitting there in the summer sunshine in 2018 in Luxembourg, uh, looking at this event, um, taking in everything, thinking about the pirate signals that had spilled across borders in Ireland, both deliberately and by accident. And we also were aware that at the end of 2018, it would be 30 years since the close down of the pirates, since the big clampdown uh, with the legalisation of local radio. And we decided that it was time to start putting together uh, an archive from our own uh, personal recordings, many of which were lost, but some of which had survived. And also by getting together people who were involved in the pirate era and interviewing them. And we held an event in the Ballsbridge Hotel in Dublin in October 2018, which was attended by over 100 former pirate broadcasters, some of them very big names today, including, for instance, Brian Dobson from RTE, who is a news presenter, well-known news presenter now, of course, and uh, started off in um, uh, Dublin Pirate Radio. And so we interviewed several people at that event and then we built uh, an archive from scratch. Brian has greater technical skills in that area than me. He was very much closely involved in the development of the of, of the Internet in Ireland in the 1990s. And we built a website and began to share the interviews that we did with um with uh, the people who who attended the uh, get together, and we also interspersed them with our own uh, recordings. And then th- there was a lot of nostalgia around the end of 1988. It was really peak nostalgia time for the pirate era, and others were posting material as well in relation to this. And people coming out of the woodwork um, after years, people we 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 didn't even know were still with us, uh, were coming back and um, were were tempted out of their hiding by these uh, memories and this nostalgia. And um, by the end of nineteen of 2018, then, we had um, a service, uh, a viable service uh, up and running by Christmas, which, of course, was the time, the anniversary. And um, then we began to receive uh, large and significant donations. And uh, just to name a few of those donations, I suppose, um, there, there was another pirate station, a shortwave station in Baldoyle that I didn't mention, actually called Radio Sky wave international in the mid 1980s and they had um, hundreds of pirate radio recordings and we received that donation and um, that was our first big donation we also received a very large donation from leon tipler the late leon tipler who was a well-known watcher i suppose of the irish scene formerly involved in offshore and licensed radio in the uk who made an important documentary called the irish pirates in the early 1980s uh, very much around the time of the raids in 1983 on the big stations and so on. We received hundreds of his cassettes through a donor in the UK. Um, We've also received uh, smaller donations um, from individuals of mostly radio in Dublin. We received a large donation from Cork uh, covering the early Cork years from the late 1970s, some very valuable material showing really that what was happening in Dublin was being mirrored, albeit on a smaller scale, in Cork. Uh, That's a large donation that we're still dealing with. We received from Eddie Bowen, um, a radio historian, uh, recordings from uh, stations in the north, uh, pirates in, in Northern Ireland. And and I suppose more recently and more significantly, we received um, the Anorex Ireland tapes collection. And this consists of quite literally thousands of cassettes and um, uh, paper documents and station brochures and flyers and stickers and advertising cards and so on. And this is so large that it's been divided up between ourselves and another service, uh, Radio Waves, um, dot FM, which also provides uh, pirate radio memories. Uh, and between us, we're, we're digitizing this uh, and sharing it uh, gradually. And, uh, th- you know, there's th- th- we have regular contacts then from individuals about um, about other uh, collections and so on. So really, I suppose our approach has grown over the months. Um, it's now quite a large uh, archive uh, with quite a lot of material. I suppose some distinguishing features are that we focus ourselves on our aim really is to do 
uh, to do our, our 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 homework and to provide a high quality uh, product for our followers. So um, we also have day jobs, uh, both of us, and uh, so we don't have a huge amount of time. But our aim is to have three or four posts per week. So we look at less rather than more, but at a good quality. Uh, we do our homework. We carefully research all of the all of the posts and uh, we tend to run thematic series um, based on certain parts of the country or uh, certain cities or certain regions and uh, obviously everything that is searchable through a system of tags and um, there are different categories in which we we post um, our, our, our recordings as well whether it's a full recording or segments from a recording what's known in the business as an air check or whether it's an interview that we've done uh, and we also have a podcast series where we interview people who are involved with the pirate radio scene or we pay tribute to people who are involved in the pirate radio scene one example of that is the late uh, Robbie uh, Dale Robbie Robinson founder of Sunshine Radio who died last year we had a special commemorative podcast about him in the autumn we also had uh, Don Moore Dr Don involved in the setting up of Radio Dublin who was a perhaps a less known figure but also a very important pioneer in Irish pirate radio at an earlier era uh, we did a special um, broadcast a podcast about him as well so that really is our approach, and um, as you know as well, um, we, we've we've covered a lot of 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 material about border radio. It's been one of our specialities, and indeed an, an ongoing interest of ours. And as we speak, we're actually uh, planning a, a new series about uh, probably one of the longest, uh, well, definitely one of the longest running pirate radio stations in Ireland, and that's Radio Star Country in Monaghan, which has been on the air more or less uh, continuously since 1988 and we're doing this feature because we feel that um that this is really quite an achievement and that the history of the station hasn't been written so at the moment we're we're working on that history and that'll be one of our um that's one of our plans for the autumn is to publish that series brilliant yeah i remember some of their stings uh, from from years gone by are particularly uh, beautiful <laughs> if i do, if i recall <laughs> Yeah, I mean, John, one thing you mentioned there about at the start, I suppose, this idea of the signal spilling over borders, this trans, trans-border trans radio, uh, which obviously is very interesting to us in the context of the show. But maybe um, you could give a little bit of background around this kind of whole history of, of border blasters or border pirates. Yeah, maybe some kind of Irish specific or, you know, specific Irish border or, yeah, if, if there's anything specific to the Irish border, I guess would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I suppose the term border blasters has been in use for a long time, really since the 1930s and 40s on the border between Mexico and the United States were some of the early and famous border blasters before the regulatory environment was cleared up, uh, particularly south of the border, because there were very large stations that were uh, broadcasting into the US deliberately and targeting uh, Latino uh, listeners there. There's a very interesting book about that by an academic called Sonia Robles uh, about uh, border radio uh, from Mexico into the US. And and um, another thing that I was struck in Luxembourg when we attended that summer school, and they've done excellent work there in the University of Luxembourg, is the extent to which, obviously, in a tiny country like Luxembourg, everything, pretty much everything is going to be tra- uh, cross-border. So staying with the Luxembourg theme, obviously, Radio Luxembourg was a, was an excellent example, you know, in our parents' generations, perhaps. I'm not sure how old you are, Frank and Tom, but certainly my parents' generations uh, were, 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 you know, were listening to Radio Luxembourg, which, thanks to the propagation of AM radio at night, would be, was quite awesome audible in uh, Ireland and in the UK. Obviously, Caroline, the offshore radio Caroline was another excellent example of that in the 1960s, 1970s and, and, and later. And, um, uh, uh, you know, the the idea of uh, high power, deliberate um, high power signals that would cross borders is, is, is with us for quite a long time. So to bring that to the Irish context, then, I suppose, um, you know, um, obviously, uh, the 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 the, the, the regulatory regimes were different on both sides of the border. They've been stricter. One side has been stricter than the other at different times in history, but certainly um, in the Republic, the law was extremely lax until the end of the 1980s. 
um, the law was an ass, um, really, and um, pirates could flock onto the airwaves uh, with impunity. And people along the border, particularly in County Louth and County Monaghan, but also County Donegal, I would say, um, realised that there was a, a way of making a lot of money by deliberately beaming their signals uh, into the north, where they couldn't be um, clamped down upon by the British authorities, but their signals could be received. So, you know, in an, in a generation before geo-blocking, there was no um, way of um, preventing these signals from spilling across the border, unless the BBC essentially was going to get involved with jamming the pirate signals, which would have been very tricky technically, but also very difficult politically, uh, given the support that there was for these stations and their wide listenership um, way beyond the, the areas where they were located. So uh, I mentioned earlier on Hugh Hardy and Radio Carousel in Dundalk began in 1978, um, the 20th of May 1978, if I remember correctly, and uh, spread then into essentially a regional radio station with um, services uh, that were, uh, there was a separate service that was aimed deliberately at the north. Um, there was a service in County Meath. Uh, there was even an attempt to open um, a radio station in Monaghan, in Castle Blaney, uh, at one stage in the Radio Carousel Network. Uh, another uh, example from County Louth, of course, is Boyneside Radio in Drogheda. But Boyneside similarly became a large and successful re- uh, regional radio station for over a decade. 1978 to 1988, and again had a separate service, Boyneside Radio North. And in these cases, the transmitters were located quite literally on the border around Carrick Arnon. Um, Jonesborough is just across the border um, from Carrick Arnon in County Louth. And uh, the transmitters would be placed um, as close as possible to the border um, with the best possible conditions in order to get the signal as far as possible. And the same applied in Monaghan, and a very famous example from County Monaghan then in 1980. A station that only came on the air for about 10 months was uh, KISS FM. Now, there's been numerous pirate stations called KISS FM. It's a very popular name. But this one from County Monaghan, the studios were in Monaghan Town, but it's um, it was beaming its signal, its uh, FM signal from Glasslock, which is very close to the border. Um, there's a famous video on YouTube of Roisin Duffy from the BBC tuning her, from, from RTE, I think at the time, yes, from RTE, tuning her radio in a park in Belfast and uh, the signal of downtown radio, uh, the licensed signal of downtown radio, was being dwarfed by Kiss FM from uh, from County Monaghan. Kiss FM's emphasis is anything but local. They're targeting the Belfast area with a rock and pop service presented mainly by experienced DJs. Kiss FM's claim to have a stronger signal than downtown radio would appear to be borne out. This is Kiss FM, and farther down the dial. This is downtown radio, which is a considerably weaker signal. Unfettered by broadcasting regulations, they're boosting their signal well beyond the limits which the IBA impose on downtown. And KISS FM had a very, very powerful uh, stereo FM signal that could be heard in stereo on FM in Scotland. So it was really an example of a, of a, of a station, a pirate station that broke into the Belfast market in a more spectacular way than previous stations had done. Although Radio Carousel and Boyneside Radio and so on were broadcasting across the border, most of their listenership was in the counties that were just across the border. So down, Armagh, um, you know, um, possibly Fermanagh, but you know, not really because they weren't that far west. But down in Armagh, particularly, but um, the uh, you know, Kiss FM was aiming deliberately at the Belfast market. And then in Donegal, obviously, there were various stations in the late 1980s. They began to proliferate. Stations like WABC continued on actually after the end of 1988. Um, there were KTOK, another station in Donegal town. And again, these were close enough to the border to be able, without much uh, effort at all, to get their signals um, across. Uh, across Across the border and aim at listeners in Tyrone and in and in Derry, uh, in particular. Another example that I think is worth mentioning is um, some of the um, uh, activities of, say, the larger stations in Dublin, particularly Radio Nova. Radio Nova in Dublin had um, a ten kilowatt AM transmitter, which is significant, uh, and 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 eventually brought a 
50 kilowatt AM transmitter into operation, which is, which is extremely powerful. And uh, they were deliberately aiming at the UK, at the northwest of England. Their news reports famously referred to giving the weather for Dublin or the Bay Area, as they called it in, in the very Californian style. And then they gave the weather for the northwest of England, southern Scotland and the Isle of Man. And at one stage, Radio Nova had an advertising office in Liverpool. So um, their signal on AM and on FM was uh, could be picked up on the west coast of Britain. We also have a very interesting um, advert in our uh, archive from Boyneside Radio, an Irish centre in Lancashire advertising a Cayley um, on Boyneside Radio, uh, which shows that Irish people, Irish diaspora in Lancashire were listening to Boyneside Radio, whose AM signal was coming across the sea very nicely and was, you know, more than audible on the northwest coast of England. The Sacred Heart Primary School, Kingsway, Rochdale, Lancashire, England, present a Cayley on Saturday the 4th of October in the school hall, Kingsway, Rochdale. Dancing from 8 to 12 to the Manchester Cayley Band. Admission £1.50. We look forward to seeing you there. So I think that's a really interesting example of, you know, uh, whatever about your signal being audible across the border, but to have advertisers from the other side of the border, and in this case, the other side of the Irish Sea, was particularly significant. In, if you listen to the, to the border station, along the uh, border of the Republic of Northern Ireland, you hear ad after ad after ad um, for, um, for, for businesses in the north. Um, so clearly, and requests on the on the on the northern side of the border as well. So there were a lot of um, listeners and a lot of supporters um, of these stations uh, north of the border as well as in their in, in their home counties, for want of a better word. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, at the moment, I know listening to some uh, current border pirates, there's a quite a lot of ads for a cheaper drink up north since the minimum alcohol pricings come in. So um, I don't know. I've been finding that interesting. <laughs> Deals in Sally Spar, Ochnacloy, off license, Smyrna Fodka Liters, seventeen ninety nine. Yellowtail wine, two for twelve pounds. Um, I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about uh, like the music for these stations, or you know, the content, or was it just very varied? Was any of it political, or was it very, you know, very unpolitical, or yeah? Could you talk a bit, little bit about that? Yeah, well, the music was was varied. I mean, the example of Kiss FM that I gave was um, that was a, a chart music station, very shamelessly, um, you know, competing with uh, similar stations in the north at the time. But many of the, I suppose, smaller border stations, for want of a better word, Boyneside Radio, Radio Carousel, had a lot of country music, which was and remains very popular. Um, really outside the cities. and um, But I think, you know, listening more and more to Boyneside, and we've featured a lot of recordings of Boyneside, it really was kind of a general interest station. I mean, yes, there was country music, but it was... It was quite similar to the model of local radio that we got, and indeed many of the same people are are, are involved today. One of the best examples being Eddie Caffrey, who's still doing his afternoon programme like he was back in the 80s. Uh, on um, he's, working, he's now on LMFM, the licensed station, uh, as opposed to uh, Boyneside previously. And um, so I think, you know, many... What I'm struck more and more listening um, to the archive material is how how really the many stations that had a local geographical remit outside of Dublin were really templates for what local radio became. And I I said earlier that, you know, practically everybody was trained by the time licensed radio came along. But the model was very much established as well. It was known what stations were were successful and and what worked. And I think that kind of local identity that uh, the pirates built up in a geographically defined area prior to 1988 lasted uh, uh, you know, ha- has has stood the test of time, and very much became the template or the model for uh, for cross for 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 licensed radio in the in the in the in the era of independent radio. So, I mean, looking at the archive in its entirety, there were also niche stations. I mean, there were stations that played only country music. I mean, some good examples near the border would be Breffney Radio in County Cavan, Ironside Community Radio in County Cavan. 
Um, those were stations that were very focused on country music. Uh, I mean, Radio West in Mullingar was a large station that was claiming to be nationwide at one stage. It had a, a you know, a large rural hinterland uh, of listeners in the Midlands. A lot of country music there uh, presented by Don Allen, the late Don Allen, Canadian uh, DJ, former offshore DJ who spent a lot of the 80s in Ireland and indeed went on to work, to continue to work in the Pirates after they were supposedly sh- shut down. He died in 1995 or 1996. So, you know, there was, I mentioned KLAS, the Easy Listening Station. There were classical music stations. There were uh, religious or Christian uh, stations um, in in Dublin and elsewhere, the Irish Christian Broadcasting Service being one example. Uh, in terms of political stations, yes, there were political stations. Sinn Féin put a number of temporary stations on the air. There was a H-Block radio at one stage um, uh, to protest um, it, during the time of the hunger strikes. And also, th- closer to home here, I'm talking to you from Galway, there was the example of Margareta Darcy, who a well-known uh, left-wing activist and feminist in Galway, who set up her radio Pirate Woman, uh, which was a woman-only radio station and uh, broadcast before and after the, the clampdown uh, on the pirates in 1988. Um, in terms of the border pirates and their uh, relations with the tricky politics, I suppose, at the time and the troubles and so on, um, there was an example where Radio Caras- Carousel in Dundalk was ordered, uh, was threatened and was told to play a, a recording um, uh, allegedly uh, from the IRA, um, but I'm not aware of, of of other stations having been taken over um, uh, or um, threatened by paramilitaries in any way. But I do remember when I interviewed people involved with Boyneside Radio, I interviewed uh, uh, somebody who'd been involved with the news service there, and Boyneside really had a credible news service. I mean, I spoke about plagiarism earlier on, but Boyneside was really generating a lot of its own news. It wasn't taking a lot of a lot of. It was doing more than simply regurgitating RTE. But I remember Boyneside, I asked them, how did they deal with the border? And they said, well, we never we never said whether a place was in the north or the south. We just went by the name of the county. So they talk about in County Armagh today, in County Down today, in County Louth today, and so on. And also, interestingly, the Boyneside radio main service from Drogheda broadcast the Angelus every day at 12 and at 6. But on the opt-out service that operated from the border that was aimed into the north, there was no Angelus at 12 and at 6. So obviously there was an awareness there that it wouldn't be, for a mixed population of listeners, that it wouldn't be appropriate to have something that would be so strongly associated with Catholicism. So those are some examples, I think, of how the, the stations um, uh, navigated that, uh, that, 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 that uh, terrain at the time. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think I also remember reading um, Radio For You would alternate between Derry and Londonderry. Every time they made a mention of it as well, they would just go back and forth between the two terms. Uh, um, I, I wonder as well, you're mentioning country music there, and I wonder is there, what is it that kind of some of the longest state running stations and some of the stations we talked about earlier that are still existing on the border play almost exclusively country or else yeah. country and gospel and I wonder what it is about country music specifically that kind of finds um, such a lasting home within uh, this particular kind of medium of communication. Yeah, I think it's very interesting, Frank. I mean, you know, two of the longest running um, commu- uh, pirate stations in Ireland by a mile now are Radio North in Donegal from Inishowen and Radio Star Country from Emmyvale in Monaghan. And yes, they play a mixture of country and religious output. Um, why is this the case? Well, I mean, if, if there's a genre of music that is possible in a medium that is unofficial or unlicensed, it means that those listeners are not being catered for in existing media. So, um, Clearly, there is, you know, we don't have any national country music station available on FM. Um, interestingly, these two stations are broadcasting on AM, but they clearly both still have listeners and uh, you don't have to listen for very long to hear requests coming in. There are ads from both sides of the border. They're clearly still talking to an audience um, and therefore the music that they play is popular. Um, the religious aspect uh, is, I presume, in order to pay bills 
deals because it is more difficult to get advertising than before. There are quite strict penalties for people, uh, for businesses from the South that are advertising on pirate radio if they're found out about it. Um, it's very interesting that these stations have been left alone uh, more or less over the years. I suspect that's because they're on AM and uh, AM is, is very much a band that is in decline in terminal decline. Unfortunately, I'm a big fan of AM radio myself. I think it has some fantastic characteristics, particularly in relation to propagation and skywave signals and so on. But these two stations are still chugging along. You know, country music is is traditionally popular in 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 rural parts of Ireland, and you know the the recordings of uh, of Irish pirate radio from the past prove that. And indeed, I know that you know certain country music artists would attribute their success to uh, pirate radio in the 1980s when they weren't being played by RTE um and uh, but they could they could be played by their by their local radio station and they were often played over and over again and given a great support so um that winning formula uh, persists now to what extent the listeners want to listen to uh gospel and religious output as well I I don't know the answer to that question but that is the seems to be I would guess that that's some sort of a financial model that seems to work in that those programs are sponsored uh, often by overseas organizations and uh therefore they help uh, towards paying the bills yeah that's that's quite interesting john one of the um <clears throat> things that strikes me is this thing you, you mentioned about you know communities that feel they're maybe not served by say mainstream stations and and kind of to some extent taking the airwaves into their own hands there you know and and, and providing for their own needs whether it's country music or or otherwise and so i, I don't know um i mean looking back through your archive um, in in the run-up to the show there's a strong sense that a lot of the stations were quite kind of community oriented and obviously in the interviews we did for the show a lot of people also talked about well this was hearing people talking about our area and so I wonder I, I don't know could you speak a little bit about maybe the kind of the community nature of, of pirate radio or, or otherwise but also in, t- in terms of pirate.ie and the sources of your archive is, is there a sense that you know people are kind of archiving these things and, giving, and handing them over to you to do so I suppose as preserving this kind of community yeah, well, I think there's two questions there, really. If I start off with the with the community radio style, if you like, and we do have a fair amount of that in our archive, and there were stations that took the community radio ethos very seriously, and some of the leading examples were BLB, Bray Local Broadcasting, and NDCR, uh, North Dublin Community Radio in Dublin, and uh, Brian Green, my co-founder, was also involved in NDCR, uh, and also, you know, stations like Kilkenny Community Radio and Community Radio Y'all uh, were both uh, important members of this, and these stations formed um, what was called the NACB, the National Association for Community Broadcasters, in the 1980s, and they were very informed by the, I suppose, the philosophy and the ethos of community radio, which is very much a world philosophy and supported by AMARC, which is the International Association of Community Radio. And despite their illegality at the time, these stations were affiliated with AMARC, and um, they uh, lobbied very hard for license. Um, throughout the period and there was a lot of political toing and froing really about the nature of uh, legalisation of radio and that was one of the reasons why it took so long to bring forward the legislation um, and uh, if we have so we have recordings of this type today one thing I would say is that I suppose we don't maybe have as many recordings of these stations as I would like Um, I think that's because many of the people who have given us donations were perhaps more interested in the kind of chart music that was maybe more popular on the bigger stations. Um, You know, there's a huge amount of material about Radio Nova and Sunshine Radio. Now, we're not particularly actually interested in those stations because they're so well covered elsewhere. And we, we try generally to focus on material that hasn't been covered so well before. There is material from Radio Nova in our archive, but not a huge a lot. Uh, we have a lot more about other stations that are perhaps lesser known. Um, so I think um, maybe it's a reflection of the fact that the community radio wasn't wildly popular with the youth who were putting the tapes into their tape decks and, and pressing record uh, at the time and that's perhaps because we have fewer recordings of them. I would like to have more recordings of, of, of the community style stations in our archive but uh, we don't have that uh, unfortunately. There are, you know, there, there are well represented but not maybe as well represented as I would like um, and uh, I suppose their legacy continues today but I would say 
say that um, when legalisation came about in 1988, 1989, the community sector was really shortchanged because uh, Ray Burke, as minister, uh, prioritised the legalisation of commercial radio. Now, there were a few community style stations who uh, got commercial licences, but most of them failed because they, they couldn't do what they were best at within the commercial model. Uh, a very good example of that was Horizon Radio in Wicklow, uh, where I worked, actually, my first legal station, uh, which was uh, built on the ashes of BLB. But Horizon was gone within two years because it was a community ethos uh, cooperative uh, trying to be a commercial radio station. And I think it was really shameful that co- community radio was left in um, on the margins like that. Uh, not perhaps surprising, given the what we know about Ray Burke subsequently Um, but it was really Michael D. Higgins as Minister for Communications in the 90s who ensured the the, the proper licensing of community radio and creating a a proper tier of community radio stations many of which we have today and many of which were based on the original pirate stations so Community Radio Yall still on the air today licensed since 1995 Um, Community Radio Kilkenny City um, recently licensed in Kilkenny very much based on the ashes of pe- some people involved in Kilkenny Community Radio. Near FM in North Dublin uh, has a direct link with NDCR uh, from the pirate era uh, and so on and so forth and there are other examples around the country as well. So yes the community focus is there and it's important in our archive but if anybody has donations to make to us as a result of this interview we would be particularly interested in those stations uh, from around the country. Um, I'm interested in this kind of earlier on, you talked a bit about geo-blocking. So like in, you know, if I wanted to listen to or watch certain BBC programs now from Dublin, I would be prevented from doing so. Whereas prior to when analog uh, signals were still spilling over here from the other island, um, you know, I could watch BBC probably quite easily from where I am right now. And I think also, I suppose, with a lot of radio stations now, like even most of the ones you just mentioned that are still broadcasting, they'll mostly be broadcasting on the internet, uh, you know, worldwide, which which is still quite different from these kind of more like geographically limited forms of uh, kind of media, which are kind of represented in the, the border or in the border stations or in some of the smaller stations. So I'm particularly interested in kind of more limited forms of media now. And do you think radio as a kind of technology, um, you know, with like more limited forms of listenership kind of has a space in our contemporary world? Well, it's very hard to say because the whole nature of the medium has been transformed beyond um, recognition. I mean, we do know from JNLR figures that FM listening is still strong in Ireland. However, when you drill down into those figures, you can see quite clearly that it's going over a cliff among younger um, younger age groups. But there still is pretty phenomenal support for local radio in, outside of the cities in particular um, in, each, in each county that seems to be holding its own. And that obviously is geographical. I mean, of course, you, can, you know, you can listen to Midwest radio on the subway in New York on your way to work if you want but uh, I mean obviously it's FM signal is over mostly over Mayo and some some spillover into Galway and, and neighbouring counties and so on but um, it's hard to see um, how the um, uh, the plethora of internet stations will become established because one of the things about the uh, one of the issues now is findability um, how do you actually come across something and the media has become so fragmented and there are so many options now and this is sometimes referred to as the long tail of the media if you think of a of a fish maybe with a kind of a fat the upper part of its body is kind of fat and plump and you know those are the big broadcasters and the RTEs and the Today FMs and so on but then right down at the tail it's very long and thin and there's an awful lot of people trying to do the same thing and not necessarily very uh, easy to discover or very easy to find so um, the thing about a radio dial is if that's your primary means of discovering radio you will come across things more easily. There's a, a more limited number of channels that you can you can quite literally tune up and down to. Um, you know, on the average radio with AM and FM, your 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 number of bands is is limited. But the the internet knows no bounds whatsoever, and uh, there can there, you know there are thousands, millions of choices uh, from around the world that you can listen to, many of which are not necessarily local to the area at all. So I do think this creates a big issue for local uh, media. But you know. 
know, media doesn't have to be relevant, doesn't have to be local to be relevant. I mean, it, if it serves a niche, whether that's a certain form of music or a certain type of talk show or a certain religious belief or a political belief, uh, you know, if if that can be can be different enough to get through the noise and reach its intended audience, um, that can be successful potentially but uh, there's an awful lot more competition than before and uh, I mean I did a bit of work on my own um, radio show on Flirt FM in Galway about um, internet radio stations and online only radio stations in Ireland but it seems that they're, they they really do come and go um, they appear and they don't necessarily survive they, they can be kind of personal projects that don't really take off and for them to be developed like any medium they need resources and they need they need some sort of a staffing structure or some sort of a governance structure and it's uh, you know impossible to do that really with one or two people you need to have uh, some sort of a core group even if they're only volunteers you need a core group that needs to be coordinated you know you need to offer um, you know, some sort of a credible service that will you know offer you know that's more than just uh, one or two live shows and so on so but then you know even the nature of consumption is changing so much and so much now is about being on demand and you know podcasts like this one are are, are not being broadcast live anywhere they're they're only available on demand they're only available to stream so i mean it's a really challenging time for the media industry and uh, the changes have been phenomenal and uh, the methods of listening and consuming are being transformed all the time and any serious radio station worth its salt needs to be on top of that on top of its game needs to be aware of the multimedia requirement really now you can't just be a radio station and um you know try to ensure that they're that their product is different enough to be to be to be picked out of the noise. I mean, the homogenization of radio, radio doing the same thing now that it did in the eighties and the nineties is is really not sustainable. The I, I would suspect that the era of the, you know, mass um, media kind of products of chart music that supposedly cater for everybody and that everybody has on in the office or in the car that era is over. Uh, niche is becoming far more important, and uh, you know, stations need to develop their niches uh, in a more sophisticated way in order to have a chance of getting any sort of a foothold whether that's analog or digital or both or whatever yeah i mean <clears throat> the uh, we were kind of talking about it earlier on today really this question of liveness and for me i think that still definitely matters this notion that when you're listening to something you know that other people are listening at the kind of same time you know rather than this on demand but but something you touched on there about this um this thing of kind of well, you've touched on a few times earlier on with the kind of talk around sort of plagiarism and obviously within the term pirate, it's kind of implied this question around uh, maybe copyright and, um, you know, I suppose, especially with a kind of quite centralised media landscape where, you know, kind of rights around things and digital rights particularly can be encoded in things. Um, but then equally, you have this archive in which I think is available through Creative Commons. So, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a tension between, say, copyright and a kind of a healthy media landscape or, a, you know, a healthy radio landscape, for example. Um, am I right in thinking just uh, just for one uh, last question, even just am I right in thinking that um, like you've quite a lot of your recordings are quite l- low quality because they're recorded by people picking up stations in other countries or not? kind of regular listeners or I wondered could you kind of talk a little bit about that sort of uh, happening in the archive or happening in the material you have? Yeah, it's it's a very common phenomenon, uh, Frank. Um, we, you know, we more or less share the recordings as they are. I mean, I, I know a certain bit about archiving as a profession and, uh, you know, the idea is you preserve and you present Uh, You don't try to doctor. um, And uh, so basically our recordings are as they were recorded, um, the ones that we that we share. And there's a variety of, I suppose, um, standards there. Some is high quality FM stereo that was recorded on good recording equipment using a good cassette. Um, local enough to the transmitter that there's no hiss or interference. Um, you know, ranging to probably the worst audio examples are some of the late 1970s stuff from Cork was recorded by putting a little uh, cassette recorder up against a, 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 an AM radio and you can hear the, the person moving around in the background. We have a couple of recordings like that, which is really DIY. She, she hadn't yet got for Christmas her radio cassette recorder that would allow her to record directly with no uh, atmospheric sound from her room or from her environment um that's one of our our big donors um and you know then the audio quality improves when you when she got her her um 
her, her, her radio cassette recorder but then you know that you might have an improvement in quality then but if that person was using poor quality cassettes um and of course cassettes oxidize over time and we've had a number of hairy moments where cassettes snap and i've been here trying to repair them and put them back together again and some of the cassettes have been unusable and um, because of their age um and then another factor is uh, recordings from am perhaps a, a daytime ground wave signal that's quite distant and quite crackly. We have recordings that were made along the uh, west coast of the UK. There's a, quite a lot of pirate radio recordings that were made in North Wales or in Lancashire or in, um, you know, Liverpool or, uh, you know, along the uh, the, the British coast. Um, and um, sometimes you have studio recordings that weren't actually broadcast at all, but are as as broadcast, but recorded in a studio. So they're the, the best quality of all. And and um, obviously then shortwave recordings, they have that has its own unique propagation as well. We have an awful lot of co-channel interference because the, the bands were kind of chaotic at the time. Um, there was a bit of kind of self-regulation going on between the pirates that, you know, there were kind of unwritten rules about not occupying certain frequencies and you weren't going to plonk down on top of somebody else um, if you were too close to them geographically. But, you know, there's one example from County Cork on 1386 kilohertz where I think in different parts of the county you had two or three different stations on 1386 so you can imagine in certain areas then the the mixing of signals and the the interference that would be would have been quite audible uh, in those cases um and uh, there's many examples of that are from around the country so in terms of audio quality we have everything really there and i think that all adds to the texture of the sound and um that's a big thing in sound studies and um you know obviously you have the atmosphere of the pieces themselves transport you back to that era but then you have the actual crackle that perhaps adds another layer of meaning you have the um the fading in and out uh as you would have with nighttime sky wave from a distant signal some of the recordings made in the uk of irish stations at night i mean it really is quite fascinating to listen to them and hear the other um the other sounds coming in and out but that's you know very much the kind of standard that a dxer would put up with so somebody who listens to distance radio signals um some of our donors were dxers they were really in it for the they were absolute anoraks. They were in it for the, for for the for all forms of propagation and catching the signal was what mattered. But many of our donors just liked the music and uh, now want to get rid of their cassettes, and therefore they're you know they were trying to record at a higher quality, um, and uh, weren't interested in poor quality mono, uh, AM or in distant AM signals. So it's all there really. In terms of the atmosphere, I, I would like to say that one thing we're very proud about is that um, uh, a number of our of our recordings were used in the very very successful recent Irish film on Colleen Keown, The Quiet Girl, which is set in County Louth and County Waterford. And they have taken recordings that they contacted us and uh, they used recordings of Radio Carousel um, from Dundalk uh, and also from ABC Radio in Tremor and Waterford uh, from the period that the film was set in. And this film, uh, Irish language film, has become a bit of an international hit as well as being a hit in Ireland. So I'm delighted that Pirate.ie has been heard at film festivals across the world and um, it's a real validation of our work when people are picking up the archive and using it in that way yeah well yeah i mean i suppose um you know that might be in a, in a way a good point to wrap it up because it kind of reiterates what frank said is that uh, no more than on colin kuhn we are also very indebted to pirate.e and to the work that we did in, in making our own our own show and so um, you know, I think we can only um, yeah, be very thankful that uh, the archive exists and actually, again, that the quality of the record, some of the recordings is so, is so great because obviously we use, uh, we use audio in our, in our work as well. Uh, so, yeah, I suppose, um, yeah, thanks, John, I suppose is the main thing to say, yeah, really. Thanks a million, John. Um, thanks yeah. very much, Frank, and thanks, Tom, um, and it's been great to take part in the discussion today.